Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow, and in today's video we will be finishing up chapter 10 of uh, Richard Wolfson's text. And the two sections left are uh, rotational energy and rolling without slipping. And the quote above is, Our description of rolling motion leads to a point that you may fir at first find absurd. In a rolling wheel, the point that's in contact with the ground is instantaneously at rest relative to the ground, meaning it's not sliding along, so that's what's called rolling without slipping. And if you see this little experiment we have up in the corner there, two, uh, two objects, a solid disc and a hoop, are being released from rest. And we're going to find out, as they roll without slipping down the incline, which one reaches the bottom first. You'll know by the end of this video. OK, so rotational kinetic energy. If something's rotating, it has this rotational kinetic energy 1 half i omega squared. I is the rotational inertia, which we discussed in the last video, and omega is the angular, angular velocity or angular speed. If you look at this big table, this is table 10.1 from your textbook, this lists a whole lot of um, linear equations from previously in the textbook, and now this new uh, angular quantity or equation. So we had these before. Uh, theta's angular position, omega's the angular, uh, angular velocity or angular speed, angular acceleration is alpha, rotational inertia I, torque is tau. Here's this equation for rotational kinetic energy. Looks a lot like the equation for translational kinetic energy or linear kinetic energy from uh, before. Instead of one half mv squared, it's one half I omega squared. And remember, here's this uh, Newton's second law. Tau, net, the net force is equal to, or net torque is equal to the rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. Okay, and the work kinetic energy theorem for rotation is that the change in an object's rotational kinetic energy is equal to the net work done on the object by the torques acting on it. And so by net work, what I mean is it's the integral of this net torque d theta over some uh, angular range theta 1 to theta 2. So it rotates by uh, this delta theta, uh, which is theta 2 minus theta 1. Uh, there's a torque applied to it the whole time. Well, it's going to change its rotational kinetic energy. So this is delta k rotational, which is the 1 half i omega 2 squared, the final rotational kinetic energy, minus the initial rotational kinetic energy. OK, so next up is called uh, Rolling Without Slipping. This is our last section. It's a, bit, uh, it's a bit tricky conceptually, so I'm going to describe it a couple of different ways. Uh, we'll start with this relative motion way, so, which basically means you've got two things happening. You have a wheel that's rotating uh, around its axle, and then also the axle is moving linearly. So here's this rotation, which is now uh, clockwise, omega and the, that's a wheel, and it's moving towards the right. So the tangential speed of a point on the rim is going to be omega times r relative to the axle. But with rolling without slipping, the axle is moving at this speed, v, uh, towards the right. And so this capital V is what we call the S prime frame. So we're going to look at uh, this S prime frame. Uh, which is the axle frame of reference, and look at these four points. Um, what's happening is that it's very simple. At each point, the uh, each point is moving at a tangential velocity, okay, which is omega times r, and it's going to be uh, to the right of the top. And the right side two is going to be moving down. Three will be moving uh, to the left, and four will be moving up. So now we're going to add uh, this. Uh, capital V to the right to all of these vectors, uh, which is the speed of the S prime frame relative to the ground. So in the ground frame now, we've got the, the new velocity is V prime in the prime frame plus this capital V. So that point one at the top of the wheel, it'll be V1 plus V. Uh, they're both little v and you get 2v, 2 omega r. In the S uh, frame, the top point of the wheel moves at a speed 2 v, where v is the speed of the axle. If you look at point 2 on the right side of the wheel, you've now, you're now adding two vectors that are perpendicular. The, the rotational part, which is going down, and then the axle part, which is going to the right, and you get uh, square root 2 
times v as being the length of this vector. So uh, in the ground frame, the point of the, on the wheel just on the front there is moving diagonal down and to the right. Point three, at the bottom of the wheel, what you've got is the rotational uh, velocity component going to the right and the axle component going to the left, and those cancel out. v minus v is zero. So in the S frame, the ground, the bottom point is at rest. So that's the idea, is that in the axle frame is going all around, in the, uh, in the ground frame, the top is moving at twice the axle speed, every other point is kind of uh, at some intermediate speed, and the bottom point is, is at zero. And you can think of the whole wheel as rotating about a pivot point, which is at the bottom. And so uh, this here, then, so just to sum up, the wheel rotates with angular speed omega, the axle moves with linear speed omega times r, where r is the radius of the wheel. And since the bottom point is always at rest, it's static friction which acts between the ground and the wheel. It's, it's one of the important things here. And another way to look at it is that, let's instead of thinking about a circle, let's think about a triangle that has three sides. Uh, if you imagine it rotating, well, this bottom pivot point does not move. That's a fixed point. What if you had four sides? Rotate it. Again, the pivot point does not move. What if you had eight sides? Rotate it. Again, the pivot point does not move. So, et cetera, et cetera. If you had an infinite number of sides, which would just be a, look just like a circle to our eyes, you still would not expect the bottom pivot point to move. I don't know if that helps, but it's another way to look at it. So it might seem hard to believe, and if you look at my bike tires, it's going long. You might think that it's sliding as it's going, but I, let's actually go a little further and look. Let's look at my back wheel, which is flat, and now you can see pretty clearly the rubber is getting laid down at the front and picked up at the back, but when it's in contact with the ground, it's not actually sliding along, okay? And even if the tire is pumped up, it's still true that you're laying down rubber at the front, picking it up at the back, but it's not sliding along at the very, very bottom. So let's see if you've got it. A car is accelerating away from a stop sign. Okay, so here it's actually accelerating towards the left. What is the main external force acting on this car which provides the net force it needs to accelerate? I'll let you read this list and then I'll tell you the answer. Okay, hopefully you answered uh, D, static friction. So the steps here for your car is that the engine first provides a torque, which in this car here is giving a counterclockwise angular acceleration to this back wheel. That's a rear wheel drive car. Step two is that the bottom of the tire is pressing backwards against the road, and that's a static friction force. And then there's an equal and opposite uh, static friction force on the road on the tire acting forwards. And it's this uh, force right here uh, which is almost all of the net force that's acting on the car to get it going away from a stop sign. Okay, so the rolling without slipping constraint is an equation. Uh, there's actually three equations, but the textbook really dwells on uh, one of them. So uh, the center of mass motion of this axle, okay, is delta x is equal to delta theta, how much the wheel rotates, times uh, r, the radius of the wheel. Here's the equation the textbook really likes, which is that the speed of the center of mass of the wheel equals omega times r, but you know, both of these are true. And then also it's true that the acceleration of the wheel is going to be the angular acceleration uh, of the rotation times r. So these are all constraints, but this is the one that you see most often in problems. So let's do an example. Uh, example 10.12 is energy conservation, rolling downhill. A solid ball of mass m and radius r starts uh, from rest and rolls down a hill. Its center of mass drops a total distance h. Find the ball's speed at the bottom of the hill. And uh, Wolfson has drawn these nice little diagrams for you. Basic uh, idea is at the beginning, it just has uh, potential energy u, which is mgh. Okay, so all the energy is, is up in U. It's not moving, so it has zero uh, translational kinetic energy, zero rotational kinetic energy, no kinetic. Then it rolls down the hill without slipping, so it's, you have to use that, uh, that um, 
rolling without slipping constraint. And at the bottom of the hill, it has uh, two forms of kinetic energy. And the total kinetic, kinetic energy will be the sum, k trans plus k rotational, where it's 1 half mv squared plus 1 half i omega squared. So let's solve this. So let's use conservation of energy to do this. The reason we can do that is because uh, static friction involved in rolling does no work, similar to normal force. Also, we're neglecting air resistance, and there's no engine or something attached to this ball as it rolls. So initial energy will be equal to final energy. Uh, so we'll call that E1 equals E2, where 1 is the beginning, 2 is the final. Uh, so U1 equals the K translational 2 plus K rotational 2. That's going to be MGH will be uh, initial equals uh, 1 half MV2 squared plus 1 half I omega 2 squared. And the rolling without slipping constraint, remember, uh, as this thing moves, is V2 is equal to omega 2 times R. And we actually want to find V2 here in this question, so let's eliminate omega 2 by solving for it. And so V2 over R, plug that into our energy conservation equation. We get 1 half M uh, V2 squared plus 1 half I V2 over R all squared. Now, what's I? Well, let's look up the rotational inertia of a solid sphere rotating about its diameter from table 10.2 in your textbook. It seems to be I equals 2 fifths mR squared. We can plug that up into that equation now. And uh, it looks like 1 half mv2 squared plus 1 half 2 fifths uh, mR squared plus this v2 squared over r squared. The r squareds cancel uh, a half times a fifth. A fifth is 2 tenths. Um, so we're looking at 5 tenths plus 2 tenths. If we rearrange there, we get 7 tenths. So mgh is equal to 7 tenths of mv2 squared. And we can cross out the m's there, solve for v2 squared. It's a 10 sevenths gh, and we get v2 is equal to square root of 10 over 7 gh. And Remember, if it's just sliding down the hill, you get square root 2 gh, and 10 sevenths is a little less than 2. So does that make sense? I think so. So as if an object was sliding without, without rolling on a frictionless surface, all the energy would go into the translational kinetic. It wouldn't have to rotate. If it's rotating, then it has to share some energy between translational and rotational, and that slows down the translational motion. So it makes sense. Okay, so last thing, as promised, uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, you've got a hollow ring and a solid disk, both are, are released from rest and roll without slipping down an inclined plane. Which reaches the bottom of the incline first? Press pause, think about that based on what you've just learned, and then I'll tell you the answer. So if you do this experiment, the solid disk reaches the bottom first. And the reason for that is this. They both start with some potential energy, uh, and then they both have to share that energy between the translational and the rotational. The rotational is 1 half i omega squared. Now, the hoop has more of its energy, a higher value of i. So if they're ro they have the same constraint of rolling without slipping, uh, what's different about the hoop is that more of its energy has to go into rotational kinetic energy. And so that has to decrease from the translational. It's going to slow it down more. Okay, So that means the hoop is going to go slower since its rotational inertia is, is higher relative to its mass than for the solid disk.